So this morning we'll be in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and the title of the message this morning is All Things uh, Made New, All Things Made New. And uh, let me go ahead and open up in prayer, and then uh, we'll read the text together, and then we'll get into uh, the study uh, verse by verse here. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, for this time together, Lord, as we get into your word. And we pray that you would just have your way, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds to hear from you this morning, that you would speak to us, Lord, that your word would minister to us as you see fit. And I pray this morning, Lord, that I would decrease and that you would increase, Lord God. Give me the words to speak. Fill this place once again with your spirit. We thank you and we love you, Lord, for the privilege of coming here together and to just hear from you through your word together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We love you and we thank you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, as I said, we'll be here in this third uh, chapter of um, 2 Corinthians. And on, on Wednesdays, you know, we've been going through the book of Genesis with the men. And uh, we've been talking about the covenant that was made between Abraham and the Lord. And um, it actually led me to this chapter because here in this chapter, and we're going to see this morning, it gives us a nice comparison between the old and the new covenant, which we now have in Christ Jesus. And as I was studying through this chapter here in 2 Corinthians, what actually came to my mind was, um, was a forest fire. And you're probably wondering, a forest fire? Well, I don't know how many of you have been in a forest fire before, but when I used to live up north in Colorado, um, I experienced several forest fires. And when there's a forest fire, you know, the fire is going to burn everything that's in its path. It's going to burn the trees, the plants, all the vegetation. It's going to burn the structures. Unfortunately, it's going to kill animals that are in the path of the fire. And um, what happens is when you have a fire, it actually changes the chemistry of the soil and the rivers. It, it changes the hydrologic or the water cycle. And what happens is you have like this ecological change that takes place and things are made new as the forest comes back. And similarly, in Christ Jesus, we are made new by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. We're born again in Christ Jesus, and we're a completely different person, um, similarly to what the forest will look like after the fire. It's a completely different place, um, but for the better. And today, Paul, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he's going to speak of what this change looks like in the new covenant and the fact that the glory of the new covenant is everlasting when you compare it to the old covenant so what we're going to see here as we go through this are 10 differences between the old and the new covenant and the fact that there is only everlasting glory in one of them okay so before we get into the the text let me go ahead and read it to you um, i'm going to start in chapter 2 uh, verse 17 and then I'll work my way into chapter 3. Uh, so here, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, um, the Apostle Paul writes, For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ, as from God and before God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need like some letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are Christ's letter, delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, covenant rather, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For, for if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Since then, we have such a hope, 
we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted, because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. So the first thing we're going to see here um, in the text is in the first three verses of chapter 3. Okay, and here Paul is speaking of these letters of recommendation. All right, that's just how he begins this chapter. So if you look at verse one, he says, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, where we first started reading, there Paul declares, he says, For we are not as so many peddling the word of God. That is of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So here Paul was reminding the Corinthians that he was not in the ministry for any type of personal or any type of financial gain. And when you think about the gospel message, you think about what was happening in the time that Paul was ministering, there was a group of people there that were called the Judaizers, and they were mixing law and they were mixing grace. They were suggesting that you couldn't come to Jesus until after you fulfilled the law of Moses. And we know, of course, that that's not true. And this is what these individuals were doing. And here, Paul, he's talking about these letters of recommendation. And often in the early church, in those times, you know, Christians would walk around, they would have these letters of recommendation. And maybe even some of these Judaizers had some of those letters that were written maybe even by some of the Corinthians. But anyways, these letters, they would actually validate their ministry. Um, however, Paul is telling them here that he doesn't need these letters. Their lives validated um, his ministry in Christ Jesus. And when you think about ministry, as you serve the Lord, success in ministry is dependent on your faithfulness. It's not necessarily numbers. It's not necessarily how big your church is or how big your pulpit is, but rather your faithfulness to the Lord. And often when I think about this, it reminds me of the weeping prophet. If you think about Jeremiah, right? Uh, 40 years, a 40-year ministry, not one convert. But yet, when he wanted to quit, the word of God was like a fire inside his heart, and he couldn't stop. And this, in my, in my mind, in my heart, is success in ministry because of the fruit that was shown in his life, because of his faithfulness um, to the Lord. That's what validated Jeremiah's ministry. In the case of Paul... Here in verse 2, he says, You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. So Paul tells them that he doesn't need these letters of recommendation. Okay, His letter was represented through their lives. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with like a letter of recommendation. You think about even ministry now and you have like this certificate of ordination. Um, there's nothing wrong with those things. But can you imagine, like in the case of Paul, having these living letters? You think about Paul, he came to the Corinthians, these heathen idolaters, and then he led them to Christ, and then their lives were changed. Their changed lives were his living letter of recommendation. They validated Paul's ministry. And when you look at verse 3, he says, You show that you are Christ's letter, delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So Paul's letter was their changed lives once again. You think about this, and I love what Weirsby says regarding this. He says, the test of ministry is changed lives, not press releases or statistics. And if you look at the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, there Paul declares regarding the Corinthian, Corinthians, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, he says, and such were some of us as well before we came to Christ. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So they were made new in Christ Jesus. They were moving from darkness to light. That change in their life, once again, it validated Paul's ministry when you compare him to those Judaizers in those times. And when you think about your life in Christ Jesus, all of us have a living letter of recommendation. Think about your own testimony. I like to call it our boastimony, right? How the Lord changes, how we were before coming to Christ and how we are after uh, coming to Christ. And every single day we're adding to that living letter of recommendation and people read us. And sometimes we might be the only Bible someone will ever read, our changed life. And that's where we have to be, we have to be careful, right? We have to guard our hearts, guard our minds, uh, because every single day we need to be filled afresh with the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to start going back to the old ways we used to, we used to be, the old way we used to be. And we don't want to be that way. We want to be born again. We want to be new. We want to be in Christ Jesus, right? So um, because of Paul, the Lord was able to use him. He was surrendered to the Lord. This change was able to take place there in the church um, in Corinth. But notice in verse 3, he also says that this letter of recommendation, he says, was delivered by us. So you can think of Paul as like the writing instrument. He says, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. So the Holy Spirit would be like the ink. Paul's the instrument, the Holy Spirit's the ink. And then he says, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts, right? So it's not written on these tablets of stone, but rather it's written on one's heart. So relative to the old covenant, which was external under the new covenant in Christ Jesus, this was a change that was internal, okay? And as I mentioned, you know, we've been talking about um, this covenant between the Lord and, and Abraham on Wednesdays. And when you think about the word covenant, um, you can think of like a promise or um, an agreement. And with the old covenant, this was a covenant of works. And this covenant was delivered by God to Moses, and it depended both on God and on man. And I believe because it depended on man, that's what made it disastrous. Because there was nothing wrong with the covenant. There was something wrong with us, with man. Right? We couldn't keep all of those commands. We couldn't fulfill those things. But under the new covenant, you think about the message of the cross, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. Number three, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later, right? We put our faith in that message. There's an element of repentance in our life, right? There's a change in our life. That is what makes us righteous in the sight of God. Everything there was dependent on God himself. Um, however, we are responsible to freely receive that by faith, right? Because of grace that's been given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So this leads to the first difference between the old and the new covenant. So the old covenant was written on tablets of stone. And it was external. The new covenant was written, written rather on the heart of man. So this was an internal change by the power and the person um, of the Holy Spirit. So that's a big difference there that we see. Now, in the next few verses, we're going to talk a little bit about the ministers of this new covenant, okay? And then we're going to speak about Paul, and then we'll talk a little bit about us as well as followers of Jesus Christ. But here in verses 4 through 6, um, Paul continues and he says, such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit um, gives life. So here, um, I love this because, you know, first of all, in the second letter to the Corinthians, I feel like we get a nice glimpse of Paul's heart. But here, he makes it pretty clear that his confidence was in God and not in himself. 
And if you remember the last time, um, you know, had the opportunity to be up here, we talked a little bit about submission. And like when you submit to God, your confidence comes from God because now you're letting him lead and do the things that he desires to do with your life. But in the case of Paul, clearly there was fruit coming from his life, right? These individuals that he was ministering to, speaking of the Corinthians, right? They had changed lives. And Paul knew this. He was nothing without God. And it's interesting because when you think about Paul, you know, this was a guy that was a terrorist before, you know, he became a servant of the Most High. You know, he was terrorizing the early church. And I'm pretty sure people thought, oh, this guy could never serve the Lord. You know, um, he, he can never be used. But the truth of the matter is, the Lord doesn't look at your past. He doesn't look at your weaknesses. All he cares about is someone who's willing to be used, a vessel, right? Sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, we have to be qualified. We have to fix our lives. That's something that I struggled a lot with when I came into ministry. But we have to understand that the Lord doesn't call the qualified. He calls the available. And then he qualifies us through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. We just have to be willing to surrender and be available to be used. And when you think about Paul, um, that's what happened to him, right? He had this wonderful experience on his way to Damascus. And now he's like one of the greatest servants that we read about in the Word of God. And here he is changing these lives, being used to change these lives because his confidence was in God, not in himself. So in verse 6, it says here, he has, made, um, he has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit um, gives life. So God has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, just as he has Paul, which leads to our second difference between the old and the new covenant. So the old covenant, remember, was ministered by Moses. And the new covenant, Jesus' disciples are ministers of this new covenant. And he continues, and actually it's in the same verse here, he says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So here we see a third difference between the old and the new. The old covenant was a covenant of the letter, right? A covenant of the letter. And the new covenant was a covenant of the Spirit. A covenant of the Spirit. And then Paul also says that the letter kills because the law, you think of the old covenant, right? It condemned all who failed it. And everyone failed it, right? And like, nobody could keep that. It exposed us, right? And it kills us before God. Which leads to the fourth difference. The old covenant was a covenant which kills. While the new covenant is one that gives life, right? It makes us alive, right? It makes the old pass and it brings newness, right? The old is made new again in the, in the new covenant. Now, the Old Covenant, when you think about the Old Covenant, it was designed to make us aware of sin, okay, and to convict us. There was nothing wrong with it. It was just, it was us. There was something wrong with us, right? Romans 7, 5, the Apostle Paul says there, For when we, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death, right? And we know that the wages of sin um, is death. So, it was us. It wasn't, it wasn't the covenant itself, but it was us. We couldn't keep all of those commands. We couldn't possibly fulfill that. So Paul says that the spirit of the new covenant gives us the law. It's written in our hearts, and it allows us to, to be directed by the Holy Spirit, by the Lord himself. It's a way of living. Now, in the new covenant, it doesn't mean that we forget about the law, but rather this means that the spirit has written the law on our hearts and has fulfilled it in our hearts. And when you think about that, when you live a spirit-filled and a spirit-led life, like we do in Christ Jesus, and I think we can all relate to this, when the Lord takes a hold of our lives, all of our plans, all of our desires, all of our motives, they suddenly become irrelevant to us. And suddenly God's plans, God's motives, God's goals, they become like the center of our life, like that becomes what we live for now. But that's only when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Now, does this mean we're going to be sinless? Absolutely not. Every single day, we're going to fall short of God's glory. But in Christ Jesus, because the Holy Spirit has come into our heart, it gives us that desire to sinless, 
It doesn't mean we're going to be sinless, but it means we're going to have that desire to sin less. And I think a beautiful illustration of this comparison between the old covenant, which kills, and the new covenant, which gives life. When you think about, for example, in the book of Exodus, the the Feast of the Golden Calf, there, 3,000 were killed at Mount Sinai. You think about the, the covenant that kills, the old covenant. But then you think about the new covenant in Christ Jesus, on the day of Pentecost, where there in the book of Acts, 3,000 were saved on that day and given life. And I just, I feel like that's such a beautiful illustration of this comparison between the two. And as we continue here forward in the next several verses, what we're going to see is this continued difference between the old and, um, and the new covenant. So in verse 7, um, verses 7 through 11, what we're going to read about here is the glory of the glory of the new covenant. So here it says, Now if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters of stones, came with glory so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. So when you look back in the book of Exodus, um, I believe it's like chapter 19. Remember when God gave the Ten Commandments um, to Moses? Remember there on Mount Sinai? Um, that the mountain was covered, it was surrounded with smoke, there were earthquakes, there was thunder, there was lightning, there was a trumpet blast, and then the very voice of God himself. So it's pretty clear here that when the law was given, there was a lot of glory, right, when it was given. But as Moses was in the presence of God, remember, his face began to shine. It began to reflect the magnificence of the Lord himself. And in Exodus chapter 34, remember that Moses had to cover his face with a veil. And, you know, the children of Israel, the reason was so the children of Israel didn't look upon his face. And, you know, that represented the glory or the countenance, his facial expression of what he was experiencing with the Lord there. And if you remember initially, the children of Israel, um, Aaron and the children of Israel, they were, they were fearful of all of this that was happening. Um, But Paul reminds us that this glory was passing away from the old covenant. And it wasn't that Moses wanted to hide the glory, but he wanted to hide the fact that that glory was fading away. And when you think about the old covenant, the law itself, it could not justify a sinner. The law could not give a sinner righteousness. The law could not give a sinner the Holy Spirit. The law could not give a sinner an inheritance or give life or give freedom. That's only possible through the new covenant in Christ Jesus. And you think about the glory of the law, the old covenant, that was a ministry that led to death, constant condemnation. It pushed people further away um, from the Lord. And, you know, I was thinking about this this past week uh, for many young people. It was, their, it was their last week of school. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the young people in our region are, are off on spring break now. And when I'm not here serving at the church, uh, my tent making is um, I, I teach chemistry and physics at an at a early college high school. And I can tell you, when you tell young people not to do something, they're going to do it even more so. So I think we can relate to this in the sense that the law told us what not to do. And because of our human nature, our sinful nature, um, we would do it, even, do it even more so, right? There was no way of stopping that. So that's just our nature. And that's what made it disastrous. It wasn't God. It was us that made the law disastrous. That is fulfilling the law, not the law itself. So when you think about the consequences of the ministry of the Spirit, the gospel, the message of the cross, it'll be far more glorious than the glory that we saw with the old covenant, which was fading away. And the only way people can experience this glory is by hearing the gospel message and by allowing the power and the person of the Holy Spirit to come into their lives and to change them, which leads to the fifth difference between the old and the new covenant. So with the old covenant, it came with glory, okay, and that glory was fading away. And with the new covenant, it came with the greatest glory, and that would be everlasting glory, right? That glory is never going to fade away. It's going to continue on forever. 
And then a sixth difference that we see between the two is with the old covenant, the glory was passing away. And with the new covenant, once again, it's everlasting. And we'll talk more about that um, in the latter verses here in this chapter. But remember um, what we just read just a second ago in verses 9 through 11. um, This ministry of condemnation, you think about the old covenant, it condemned everyone um, who couldn't keep it, right? No one could keep it. It came with glory for a certain time, but the ministry of righteousness, speaking of the message of the cross, the new covenant, it has glory that exceeds all of that. All right, so this leads to our seventh difference between the old and the new covenant. So the old covenant was a ministry of condemnation, while the new covenant was a ministry of, um, of righteousness. So ministry of condemnation, new covenant is a ministry of righteousness. So when you compare these two, in a sense, the old covenant really had no glory, right? That was going to last forever. It was going to, to fade away while the new covenant had glory that excels, it moves forward. And I was thinking about this, and one thing that came to my mind was actually the sun and the moon. And, you know, I don't know if you all have had some time to, to, I mean, you don't want to look at the sun directly, but maybe the moon, look at the, looking at the moon directly. Don't look at the sun directly, you'll hurt your eyes. But um, when you think about the, um, the glory of the moon, the glory of the moon or the, the, the shine of the moon, the moonshine, it, it comes, the sun, the, the sun reflecting off of the moon, rather, it's coming from the sun, right? Like the moon is not generating its own light. And when you think about the, the radiance or the flux or the energy that's coming off of the sun, um, you know, that shortwave radiation that's heating the planet, that is what's being reflected off of the moon. So when I think about the moon, I think of the old covenant because like the old covenant, the moon depends on the sun to reflect that light or that glory. Um, However, the sun doesn't depend on the moon. It only depends on itself. And that's kind of like the new covenant. You think about the sun and there's this this nuclear fusing or fusion that's taking place on the sun, right? You have hydrogen atoms combining to form helium. They release light energy and heat. That's only dependent on what's happening on the sun. And likewise, when you think about the, the new covenant, what has happened the Lord going to the cross, all of these things, it only depended on the Lord. But we have a responsibility to freely receive that gift of grace. Um, But it's a different situation when you compare it to the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant, there was like no chance, right? It was impossible. But here, we have a mediator, we have a hope, we have a future in Jesus Christ. And it doesn't depend on man anymore. It just depends on God. And once again, we do have that responsibility um, to receive that that love, that grace through faith. So in verse 11, we see this nice contrast between the giving of the law and, of course, the day of grace, right? The old covenant, as we've already mentioned, the glory was passing away. Um, In the new covenant, that glory is going to endure forever. And it's just weird that you would have these Judaizers that were mixing these two things. Like, you don't need these two things together. You only need one of them, which is the new covenant. And um, they they were leading people to confusion there. So our eighth difference that we see here uh, with the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Covenant was destined to be done away with, and the New Covenant was destined to last forever. And in fact, we see a reference to this. If you look in the book of Hebrews, there the author of Hebrews in chapter 8, verse 13, there he speaks of the Old Covenant. He says, in that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And in the new covenant, Hebrews 13, 20 through 21 tells us, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. So kind of a sharp contrast there. The old becoming obsolete and the new excelling or moving forward um, in Christ Jesus. Now, in the next uh, four verses, we're going to see what the character of this new covenant looks like, verses 12 through 16. So it says here, or Paul writes, Since then we have such a hope. We act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. 
For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So notice here um, in, in that 12th verse, the, the hope that is spoken of here, as we know, is the fact that that gospel message, right, the new, under the new covenant in Christ Jesus, that will never fade away. And because of this, we can speak with great boldness, hiding nothing. We don't have to wear a veil, right, because of our hope and our promise in the, um, in the new covenant. When you think about the old covenant, that separated us from God. But the new covenant unites us with God. And because of this, we can come boldly to his throne of grace. So part of this, this um, new covenant was the fact that God came to this planet in the form of a man named Jesus, his son. right? And because of that, Jesus experienced things that we have experienced and therefore, he's identified with us. Though he was sinless, unlike us, um, and because of this, we can come boldly to his throne of grace. Verse 13, remember Moses, he lacked boldness under the first covenant, um, a covenant that was fading away, right? The, the glory of it. So he wore a veil. It's not that he wanted to hide the glory itself, but rather he wanted to hide the fact that the glory was fading away, which leads to our ninth difference between the old and the new covenant. So with the old covenant, it was veiled. It covered the glory. In the new covenant, it's unveiled because of the everlasting glory that comes with it. And when you look at verses 14 and 15, the children of Israel in that time, they were unaware of what Moses was really hiding. And, and Paul tells us here that the Jewish people of his day, they still held on to the law. And they did not, they did not realize that that glory of the law had passed away, and it was now being fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And this veil still lies on their hearts, and we still, and they still believe, rather, that there's something more glorious when it comes to the ministry or the law of Moses. And then in verse 16, it's very clear here that it's only through the knowledge of Jesus Christ that that veil can be lifted. So this veil must be removed from one's heart. And, you know, we're talking about Jewish people, but really, in essence, it's everybody. Gentiles as well. Those that do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they have a veil over their hearts as well. And that veil needs to be lifted. And that's only possible through Jesus Christ. Because veils separate us from God. And those veils, once again, can only be lifted when they hear the gospel, when they allow the Holy Spirit to come into their lives. And this is where we come in as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. And, you know, this is something we've been talking quite a bit about um, in the youth group, you know, as we've been going through the Gospel of Luke there. You know, you think about this treasure that's been given to us. Um, you know, this is something we don't just want to hide. We want to share this with everybody around us. And it's this love of Jesus Christ, especially right now with everything going on. A lot of people who are not in Christ are afraid. They're losing hope with everything happening in the world and even whatever's happening in their own lives. And we want to give them that message of hope that message that saves, that message that gives life. And that's only possible if we allow the Lord to use us. And we need to have that heart of evangelism, that heart of compassion. And in fact, in Romans chapter 15, verses 20 through 21, Paul makes it pretty clear here. We need to go beyond these four walls. He says, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he has not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. And I think as believers, sometimes we think the world's our enemy, but we have to understand that the world is our harvest field. They're not our enemies. Our enemy is our own hearts becoming hardened towards others, and that's what we have to be careful of. And as ministers of the new covenant, you and I, all who have called upon the name of the Lord, People are reading our lives every single day. We're these living letters of recommendation for the faith, as Paul mentions at the beginning here. But it's not enough. People can't just see how we live. We have to vocalize that gospel message so they have the opportunity to receive it. Um, but we also have to be careful because we're not going to change people. I know that this can be a difficult thing, especially when you're trying to minister to family. I think it's harder with family than with strangers because you want to change them. You want them to know the Lord. 
But the Lord's timing, in my opinion, has never been my timing. And only the Holy Spirit can lift that veil. We can't lift those veils. We can try, but we're not going to. It's only through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Just like he did in your life and in my life. And I'm so grateful that the Lord didn't give up on me. Because he doesn't. And people kept praying for me as well. For that veil to be lifted. Okay. Now, in verse 17... Uh, the, Paul continues, he talks about the liberty, the freedom that we have in the new covenant. He writes there, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is, um, there is freedom. Okay, so here we see a reference to the Holy Trinity. Here he's speaking of the spirit of God. And in the case of Moses, you know, Moses had the liberty to meet with God one-on-one, um, -on -one, face to face, without a veil, Right? It was the presence of the Lord that gave him that liberty, that access. But we too, under the new covenant, we have complete access to the Lord. I mean, we don't see him face to face right now, but we have the power and the person of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have the word of God. We have the mirror of God's word, right? Because he is the word. So we have that complete access to him um, through those avenues. One of these days, we'll get to see him face to face. Um, not at this moment, but I'm looking forward to that day. But unlike Moses, right, um, we all have that, that access and that opportunity. In that case, it was only Moses that had that opportunity. And I love what Oswald Sanders says regarding this. He says, freedom in Christ is equal to freedom to serve one another and our master and to obey and to worship him. So because of our access to the Lord, now we are able to be set free from the bondage of sin because we can come to him whenever we want or whenever we desire to, um, to ask for his forgiveness and to ask for his help. Now, Ephesians 2.18 tells us, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. So once again, unlike the old covenant, we don't need a high priest as a mediator between us and God, right? Um, it's through him, Jesus Christ, right? He's our mediator. He's the one between man and God. We can approach him boldly, right? We can approach God in Jesus' name. And then we can see here by one spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, our helper, we have complete access and we can experience the presence of God in our lives now. Like we don't have to wait until we see him face to face because we have all of these resources at our fingertips now in Christ Jesus. So this leads to our 10th difference between the old and the new covenant. So in the old covenant, Man was our mediator, right? It was Moses. And in the new covenant, our mediator is Christ Jesus. So old covenant, man is our mediator. New covenant, our mediator is Christ Jesus. And then notice in verse 18, here we see the transformation that we see under the new covenant. It says, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So from verse 16, we know that when we turn to the Lord, um, we have an unveiled face. Okay, so then what then? What does that mean? So under the old covenant, only Moses had that capability of beholding the glory of the Lord unveiled. But under the new covenant, we have that complete ability. When you think about beholding, Think about like a mirror. Think about the word of God as the mirror of God's word. James 1, through 25 tells us, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So as we seek the Lord in his word, he is revealed to us, not face to face. We see him right now kind of in this reflection, this dim image that we can't see completely. But, you know, you think about a mirror. And, and, you know, I, I hate looking in the mirror because you're like, oh, I can't get a filter to fix, you know, like your face or something. But when you think about a mirror, mirrors don't always reveal everything, do they? And this is the beauty of God's word. We don't have everything revealed to us yet. So there's still more, um, more to come. 
And the glory that we behold right now is the Lord seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's where we want to be, in the presence of the Lord, our Heavenly Father. And when you think about beholding, think about like carefully studying or carefully looking um, at the Lord through His Word. And when I was thinking about this, it kind of reminded me of my days when I was in, in graduate school, when I was working on my, on my PhD. When you write a dissertation, you, you study, you observe, you learn everything you possibly can about the topic. And likewise, in Christ Jesus, all of us in this room are PhDs. We are all praying heaven down together. And as we get into the Word of God, we're trying to learn everything we possibly can about the Lord. We're trying to look at Him as closely as we possibly can as we write our own living letters, our own dissertations, if you want to call it that, a recommendation for the faith. And as we get into His Word, He reveals things to us, things that we um, are convicted of but are able to fix by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we look more and more like Him. So in other words, we need to spend more time with Him. And I've mentioned this before, we are as close to God as we choose to be, right? It's, it's up to us to get into the Word. And I love what Alan Redpath says regarding this. So Alan Redpath, he, he wrote this really, this really nice book. It's called The Royal Route to Heaven. It's based off of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So I highly, I highly recommend it to you. But Alan Redpath says in his book, You see, in the life of a man who has seen Christ, the glory of God in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord, the glory of God in a life submitted to the sovereignty of his Father, inevitably truth begins to dominate character. And the life of Jesus Christ begins to be reproduced in and through him. So that should be our desire. That should be our heart, right? We're being transformed, as the word of God says here, from glory to glory. And that glory, once again, is everlasting, unlike the, the decreasing glory of, um, of the old covenant. So the mirror of God's word, it exposes, it convicts, and it, it, it just it takes all that filth out of our lives. It removes all that dross from our lives to make us look more like Christ Jesus. So as by the Spirit, Paul says here of the Lord, so through the new covenant, we have full access to that transformation because of the Holy Spirit. We're going from glory um, to glory. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, God often goes to the gutter to find the recipient for his grace. He lifts him out, washes him, and transforms him, making him into a child of God, fit for his kingdom. That is is God's grace. And certainly we're all grateful for what God has done for us in our lives. He has made all things new for you and for me, and he's continuing to do that. So this morning, as we close here, um, we are reminded of the fact that in Christ Jesus, the new covenant, there are, there's everlasting glory and there's so much more to look forward to. All of us in Christ Jesus are these living letters of recommendation for the faith right? We're made new in the new covenant. And as we went through this chapter, there were 10 differences we saw between the old and the new covenant. So I'm just going to mention these very quickly here, um, just to solidify or to close off this this study. So the first difference we saw was with the old covenant, it was written on stone tablets. The new covenant was written on the heart of man, okay? The second difference we saw is with the old covenant, Moses was the minister of this covenant. And in the new covenant, Jesus' disciples were the ministers. The third difference we saw was with the old covenant, it was a covenant of the letter, and the new covenant was a covenant of the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing we saw was that the covenant was, the old covenant was one that killed, while the new covenant was one that gave life. It made us alive again. It made all things new again. The fifth difference we saw was with the old covenant came the glory right? The glory came when it was given, and then it started to fade away. But with the new covenant, it came with the greatest glory, and that glory would be everlasting. It would last forever. The sixth difference we saw between the old and the new covenant, in the old covenant, the glory was passing away, and the new covenant, the glory was everlasting, right? Seventh difference we saw was with the old covenant, that was a ministry of condemnation. It condemned, right? And the new covenant was a ministry of righteousness, okay, because of the cross. Our sins are forgiven. Um, The eighth difference we saw with the old covenant, it was destined to be done away with, and the new covenant was destined to last forever. Ninthly, the old covenant was veiled, 
the glory was covered. Um, not that Moses was trying to cover the glory, but rather he was trying to cover the fact that the glory was fading away. And then the new covenant, it, it is unveiled, right? The everlasting glory doesn't have to be veiled anymore. Um, and then lastly or tenthly, the old covenant, man was our mediator. But in the new covenant, our mediator is Christ Jesus. We don't have to depend on a man anymore. So hopefully we have all come to the realization of the abundance that we have in the new covenant in Christ Jesus. And as we continue to minister this new covenant to people that don't know the Lord, we have to remember that we can only stand in victory if we keep our eyes on, we have a clear view of Christ Jesus. And right now for me, I know that this, this view of Jesus is not clear enough for me. You know, as we continue getting into the word, he becomes more and more clear to us. And until we see him face to face, he won't be, you know, completely clear to us. And that's what we're looking forward to. So every single day, we should have that desire to get into his word, to get to know him a little bit better, spend more time with him. That way, his word transforms us from glory to glory, as the word of God says here. And every single day as that happens, we're adding more to these living letters of recommendation for the faith, right? The old is made new. And let me close with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. There Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Amen. Well, if you're joining us via the live stream, or maybe even here in person, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're struggling with everything that's happening in your life, maybe all the difficulties that are going on around the globe this morning, um, we want to give you that opportunity. And um, if that's you, if you could just close your eyes, bow your head, and just repeat um, this prayer after me. Well, Heavenly Father, this morning I come to you. I desire to declare you as my Lord and Savior. On Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I also recognize that I am a sinner and in need of a Savior. Lord, forgive me of the sin in my life, the sin in my heart. And please fill me afresh. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. Um, there is a celebration going on in heaven on your behalf. And um, if you uh, want to get connected with a Bible teaching church, you want more information, anything that you need, you could always leave a message or a comment there um, in the below the video description. Or if uh, you want to call the church, reach out to the church, or you can just come visit us in person. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., and uh, our building is located at the corner of Hondo Pass and, um, and Gateway South. So thank you so much for taking the time this morning to come here and to worship the Lord and to hear from the word this morning. Uh, we pray you have a blessed week. Uh, we love you and we hope to see you again soon.